uh, sort of uh, use Proteus. Um, uh, do you do you have access to Arduino on your computer? Uh, yeah. Wait. Um, I think you can do it on the website and stuff, though. Um, yes, you can do some parts yeah. on the website as well. So you can um, write the program uh, with us, uh, and you can test it when you have access to your computer with Proteus. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so they got the, um, the, the website um, that would have the... So basically, the presentation we are using today is this one here. Um, I'm just going to open that up. Um, it's the same presentation here. Um, so we'll start with a bit of a brief introduction. Uh, so you know what we're expecting from you uh, for the innovation challenge and um, what well, you should be. Mm -hmm. Will from Glen Dowie wrote the code for the uh, Knight Rider bonnet oh, and, cool. uh, and submitted it. So congratulations uh -huh. and uh, yes. I'll share it with the later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Maybe, um, do you want to run it on your computer or I can run it on my computer and then everyone can see it uh, later in uh, on the day? I'll email it to you. Okay, yeah. cool, cool, sounds good. Um, right, so um, starting off, um, just to give an introduction to um, myself and, and our university, I'm from the University of Auckland. Uh, some of you may have heard of us. Um, some of you may have visited us during some of our careers evenings. Uh, so the Auckland University is in Auckland. It's in the center of Auckland, right in the middle of the city. Um, we have three campuses. Um, you could see in this uh, photo where it shows Auckland. Um, and uh, right in the middle of uh, the city, we have the city campus. And then we have near the hospital, we have our medical campus. And then in Newmarket, we have our Newmarket Innovation Precinct, um, where all the new ideas are being sort of developed and uh, tested. And we're working with quite a number of national and international um, leading industries to work on quite brand new ideas. Um, Auckland Uni is the biggest uni in New Zealand and, and the best uni in New Zealand, uh, <laughs> ranking wise. Uh, we have about almost 50,000 students and 5,000 staff members in the university. So it's, it's a very large organization. I come from the um, Department of Electrical Computer and Software Engineering. Um, as the name suggests, uh, we teach uh, things around electronics, electrical systems, uh, computers, and also software. So we teach a quite large number of subjects. We are one of the biggest departments um, in the university and also one of the strongest departments in the university. And we belong to the School of Engineering. Um, so the School of Engineering has many other departments. Um, mechanical department is one of them. Uh, you would have one of my colleagues from the mechanical department teaching you CAD um, very soon as well. Uh, then we have civil engineering, uh, we have chemical engineering, uh, we have engineering science. Uh, so these are some of the subject fields that, that we offer from the engineering faculty or the engineering school. Um, this, in the photo, you can see our brand new building. I'm on this building on level six, somewhere up here. Um, and we have brand new labs here. So if you, if you happen to be in Auckland and if you'd like to visit our labs, um, send me an email. Uh, so on the presentation link, there's a link to my details uh, LinkedIn profile. You can click on that and uh, find me and send me uh, your information. Um, or it less can send you details of uh, my contact details. Uh, you're welcome to come along and uh, have a look at some of our labs and uh, because it's really fancy, it's just got opened this year in January um, and everything's uh, basically brand new, flashy building, flashy equipment. Uh, so it's, it's very impressive in there. Um, the, our department, um, like I said, it is one of the strongest um, in the faculty and also in the university. We are known worldwide, um, mainly because we do quite a lot of cool things. Uh, we, um, for example, the research group I am part of, um, which is called the Power Electronics Research Group, um, we do things that helps people transfer power wirelessly. So um, if you have a mobile phone these days, um, how many of you have uh, mobile phones that can be charged wirelessly with you? I'm not sure. Yeah. You're not sure? Um, most of the mobile phones these days tend to be wireless charging. And this is a technology we invented from our 
um, group. Um, and we license this technology to uh, companies like Apple and Samsung uh, who take this technology from us and then uh, actually sell it to you guys. Uh, we also work with quite a number of other companies where we are working with uh, some of the companies who makes wireless chargers for electric vehicles. Um, and then we, have, we work with companies that make wireless charging for um, things like biomedical applications where you have implants inside your body uh, in patients and they need power. Um, we, we design systems that will power these devices. Um, we, every year we take about 300, uh, 200 or 300 students in. Uh, so we have a total number of about 600 plus students in the department. Um, and we also have postgraduate students, uh, which means uh, students uh, doing higher studies after undergraduates. Um, quite a number of them, we, we have probably the highest number. In the fact, as a department, we have about 150 postgraduate students. Um, I have about 35 colleagues in the department. Uh, we all are teaching subjects in electrical engineering, electronics, circuit design, computers, uh, microcomputers like we're gonna learn today, as well as software engineering. So uh, we, we also teach uh, one of the very popular programs we teach is software engineering. Um, right, um, so this is a small video that um, shows uh, some of the things that our um, team is working on in, in terms of wireless power transfer. So we, we are worldwide, we are thought as the um, innovators uh, of this technology. So every, everywhere we go, uh, we are regarded as the best in, in this area. Um, so you can move it. Cool, hope you enjoyed that video. Um, there are many more videos on YouTube that you can watch. Uh, if you search for wireless power transfer, some of them would be from our, our group, um, uh, some of the leading ones. All right, so that's, that's an introduction to um, where I come from. Um, now let's have a look at uh, what we are gonna do in this um, innovation challenge for eVelocity um, and what we are expecting you to build. So in, in simple terms, what we're expecting you to do is um, some form of a dashboard for your electric vehicle. So it'll show some of the key um, information that your driver would like to see. Now, as if you have a car, uh, now I have a photo here, which is a very fancy dashboard um, that comes in the Tesla. Um, you don't have to implement something that as fancy as this one, but we're expecting you to at least show some of the very basic information. Now, what would you think that would be very useful for your driver to know in your electric car or an electric cart? Any, any pieces? Um, speed? Yep, speed is one of the very important ones, yes. Remaining battery life. 
Yep, battery life is very important when you especially do the economy run, right? Um, and also how much energy you consume. So when your drive is uh, driving and trying to optimize the amount of energy the car is consuming, you want to make sure that that information is available to the driver to see so that they can make sure that it's, it's driven at the most efficient way. So you preserve the battery. Um, anything else? Temperature. Temperature, yeah, uh, that's also important. Um, so when, when you start uh, using up the battery, uh, the battery, if you're heavily using the battery, it will get hot. And if you're especially using things like lithium ion batteries in your car, uh, then it's a, it's a very good idea to monitor the temperature because if you exceed the working temperatures, you'd end up creating an explosion. Uh, so it's, it's a very good thing to monitor the temperature of the battery also. Nice to monitor the temperature of your uh, motor if possible. Um, also, you need to do indicators, right? You need to do left, right indicators, brake indicators. Um, that, that also is quite important. Um, anything else that you can think of? You got the speed, the acceleration, the distance, the battery, uh, how much energy is in the battery. The distance traveled. The distance traveled, yep. That's also quite nice. Um, so the distance traveled. These are some of the key things you can show. Now, you don't have to, for the innovation challenge, you don't have to do all of these because it might take quite a bit of time to implement all of them. Um, we are expecting at least some of the basics. So if you at least have the speed um, and the battery uh, capacity, um, the power yeah. you're, you're driving the car at, uh, which is also quite important. So you might, be, you might have a um, 300 watt motor or a one kilowatt motor, but you're not always uh, putting that much energy to drive. So your driver might want to know how much um, energy are you driving the car, um, providing the motor, uh, how much power are you providing the motor, um, so they can uh, tweak as they go, okay? Um, so at least uh, three of these parameters, if you can show them um, in your car, uh, then you would qualify for the innovation challenge and uh, we would have a really good chance of winning, a, uh, winning uh, the top award. Um, so we would, in this uh, module or uh, the modules, uh, we would learn how to do this. We would pretty much tell you how to do this exactly. Um, and um, therefore they, you would learn how to do it and then uh, you're expected to do, uh, do your implementation. Um, and, and hopefully by the time you come to the final race, we would be able to see this on your car. Okay. Um, now let's assume that we are going to do uh, battery voltage, um, battery capacity, the power, and the temperature. If we want to do this, we need to measure things about the battery. Now, a few things we can measure about the battery is uh, we can measure the um, current that's going from the battery into the motor. That will tell us about how fast the battery is discharging, how much power are we giving the motor. Another thing we could do is we could measure the voltage across the battery. That will help us understand how discharged is the battery. As the battery discharges, the voltage of the battery change. So we need to be able to sense this uh, battery voltage and uh, decide based on that, okay, I might have 50% left in my battery or I might have 30% left in my battery. Um, the so The combination mm -hmm. of those two things will give you the power drain from the battery. Exactly. Uh, which is really important because it tells you how much energy is coming out of the battery being used by the motor per second. So it's quite an instantaneous uh, feedback about how economically you're driving. Yeah, yeah. And your driver can use this information right in front of him, if he has it right in front of him on a, on a screen, um, to drive the best um, economy run um, and actually the best results as well. So not only you would be able to win the um, innovation challenge, you'd be also able to win most of the other events by doing this. Um, and you can use this information as you go uh, before the races. You can use it to practice um, your drive. You can use it to um, optimize or um, sort of um, better design your system uh, so you achieve your best performance. Um, the speed um, measurement is a bit, bit more challenging. Uh, you have to use something called an um, encoder. Um, that basically measures how many turns your wheel turns. Uh, per minute. So um, in a car, usually this is uh, done using a magnetic sensor. So it's a magnet and then um, on the car side, uh, there is a, a magnetic uh, wheel. 
So it counts the number of times uh, the wheel has north and south poles. It counts the number of times the north and south pole changes to de determine how fast this wheel is uh, rotating at. Uh, now, um, an easier way to do this is with your ca cart, um, is to use something called an optical um, encoder or an optical tachometer. Uh, now, it does the same thing as a magnetic one that's a lot more expensive, the magnetic one. Um, but the optical one is really cheap and it's really easy to um, understand because what you have is an LED and a wheel that has slots in it and a light detecting um, sensor. So when the slots align with the LED, light passes through and you see it on the light detecting sensor and uh, the number of slots you can then count and from that you can decide how many times the uh, wheel rotate. When we come to this, we'll, we'll learn a bit more about each of these technologies. So we'll first start with measuring the current and the voltage of the battery and see how we can use it to work out the capacity of the battery, the power battery is providing. Um, and then we would go into how do we look at the um, number of, um, or the speed uh, by counting the number of rotations of the wheel. Then we would go and look at some other principles like how do we, um, generate um, our signals for the brake lights or the turning uh, lights and so on. Right. Um, continuing uh, forward, um, like over here we are showing how this can be sensed, but just sensing is not enough to display it on a screen. We need to take the values from this, all these sensors coming in, and we need to now start processing this to figure out the exact details. In the old days, um, this was really hard because we didn't have any computers. But nowadays we can use these tiny computers that we can um, use in our car, like an Arduino. And this can work out all this uh, information we need, things like the battery capacity, uh, the power going into the motor, um, whether someone's pressed the brake pedal, how, how fast is the car going, all that can be calculated using small computers these days. Um, and for our project, we are going to use an Arduino Nano as our computer that would take all the values from the sensors and work out all the parameters we need to display on our screen or the dashboard. Um, now, one of the problems is uh, computers thinks in terms of ones and zeros. It doesn't really like uh, signals coming in from the battery, like voltages and currents, which are analog signals. Do you guys learn about analog and digital signals at school? Not normally, Dalipa, no. Okay. okay, so an analog signal is something that has a value, um, it can be any value, and it, the value changes over time. So you can think about the battery voltage, um, and if you're using a, a 24 volt battery, uh, the battery voltage is not going to be exactly 24 volts. As it discharges, it'll come down to 22 volts, 21 volts, and so on. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be any number between, say, 24 volts and 21 volts as it discharges. Um, a digital system is where you don't have these um, continuous numbers. It's only two different values that you can have in a computer. It's either a one or a zero. A one in a computer, we call it a high or a logic. Uh, one and a zero um, is called a logic law um, or we call it a false um, and so on. So it's it's only um, two options you have in a computer. It's either a one or a true, um, a zero or a false. Um, and, and using this, the computers basically can work out multiplication, can do addition, um, can do all sorts of different tasks to make decisions for you. Um, so what we had to do is, uh, what we measure from the battery voltage, the current and so on, we need to be able to um, convert it to something the computer can first understand and then use the computer um, to do this um, calculations for us and then display these values on a screen uh, so that the driver can see it. There are, there are processes to change analog to digital signals and digital back to analog signals, and we'll be using both of those in here. Process. Yes. Yeah. And we'll also use uh, things like uh, a Bluetooth module. Um, if you, uh, in this uh, uh, course, we would not teach you how to use a Bluetooth module, but we will tell you some of the information that you would need to use a Bluetooth module. So, for example, if you want to be um, 
uh, quite adventurous and do something quite fancy, then you can use the Bluetooth module and send information from your Arduino to your mobile phone or your laptop. So you can also view this data quite nicely on a computer or a phone uh, and have more access, like you can put it on the internet, you can uh, graph things quite nicely. Uh, so these are some of the other things that you can do uh, once you learn the basics, uh, which you'll teach in this course. Right, um, now how do you do the sensing? Um, these days you can buy uh, modules, um, for example, LIS uh, would be able to provide you some of uh, most of these modules that you can use, um, for example, to sense the voltage, to sense the current, uh, to work out uh, the speed of the wheel. All these uh, are readily available these days uh, that you can buy as modules and connect them up together into an Arduino Nano um, using shields or, or your own circuit board. Um, so you can get all that information connected to the Arduino easily. Um, <laughs> at Oakland University, we built our own uh, circuit um, last year. Um, I called it the Evo Sense board. Um, so I'm showing you a photo of that uh, board here for you to see how uh, it could be done. On that board, we basically had um, one end of it connected to the battery, the other end of it connected to the motor. Uh, so it basically has a current sensor that measures the current going from the battery into the motor. It also has a voltage sensor that measures the voltage across the battery. Um, it had the Arduino Nano, uh, which is a very tiny computer. You can see it, it, the computer is here. It's, it's less than uh, a, a dollar not, uh, a dollar coin. Um, and then uh, we also had a Bluetooth module and we had um, headers that you can connect up uh, a display, uh, a, um, a speed sensor, uh, USB connection to your computer, all these other things. Um, you could, um, we would try to build something similar this year with a bit more functionality. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, if things get better towards the end of the year, we might be able to even make it available for you guys. Uh, but at this stage you can um, easily contact Les or, or go on eBay and buy your own uh, modules that would do similar functionality. Dalipa, could I just say that Colin yeah. has um, asked for a kit of bits that hang off the um, Arduino to make mm -hmm. it work. Since most of the common things that people would want to uh, to measure in their vehicle mm. and uh, a display or whatever to uh, to output it, mm. and uh, I'm just in the process of um, costing that. Mm -hmm. and I'll uh, I'll put it out at, at cost price um, as soon as I can do it. Mm. Um, for instance, the Arduino itself is about, we can supply it at about $12.50. Mm. I know that I bought some at $39 last year from a <laughs> retail outlet. So yeah. we can save a bit, a bit of money and we can provide it economically to, and affordably to schools. So yeah. um, I'll work with Colin and Delipa to make sure that that kits what people want. Yeah, the resistors and little things that make the sensors work are also included. Yeah, and also another way um, I'm planning uh, to run these uh, modules is at the end of each module, we will have an exercise that you can do from home, um, like like the Night Rider light uh, kit uh, that one of the students yeah. did. Um, and if you do it, then uh, from the University of Auckland, we would send you an Arduino Nano um, to your uh, home, or uh, you can send us an um, address and we'll we'll post it for you uh, as well as a, a challenge okay well, that's good will's got one on the way <laughs> <laughs> um right so um how would you display the uh, measured signals um what we suggest this year um is um we use uh, an lcd panel again Liz has these ones uh, with him uh, uh, quite a lot of them um so it's a panel that's um, quite easy to uh, be used with an Arduino. There's a lot of examples on how to use it. Uh, we are going to look at how to use it as well. Um, so it's a, it's a small LCD panel. I can uh, show you a, an example here. Um, so on the Arduino screen, it's, it's like that. It's um, two lines of 16 characters. Um, so you can this still display quite a bit of information. Um, you can start here and then improve after you get this working, you can uh, start using all sort of fancy displays. Uh, for example, if you had a Bluetooth module that communicated with your phone, I think Liz, you had Bluetooth modules as well, right? The HM10 modules? Yeah, we did, we used them with your board last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so you can use uh, something called an HM10 module. Uh, it's a Bluetooth module, uh, which is again uh, quite 
readily used with the Arduino. There's a lot of information about how to use it. Uh, and we'll also look at some of the information in, this, uh, um, in these modules. Um, you could communicate from your Arduino with your mobile phone. And I created this nice app uh, last year where you can take that information coming from the Arduino and show it on your phone uh, much nicer than on a LCD panel. Um, to do this, uh, I used a software called App Inventor. Uh, it's a very simple programming interface uh, developed by uh, MIT in US. Um, and it's a really uh, nice system which you can use uh, to uh, do quick projects, uh, quick mobile applications uh, develop yourself. If you like to learn a bit more about software, then that's the interesting thing that you can look at. Um, you could also, um, we saw last year, some students also tried to um, take the information from the car and put it on the cloud. So anyone can see it and uh, see how the car performs over uh, uh, your economy run, for example, how much energy did it take uh, going, from, uh, going through the uh, run. Uh, it gives quite nice visual information. And also you can use it during your testing so that you can uh, improve your performance, um, iron out the bugs you have and so on. So these are some of the things we will do. As a minimum, we would expect you to have uh, an LCD screen, a simple LCD screen that shows some of the information from the car. Um, and these modules, if you follow all the modules with us, you would learn how to do this um, and the program you would have written about 90% of the program you need to uh, put in your car with us together, okay? So all the files that you, you would, uh, all the software that you would write, all the testing you would do with uh, me in these modules, keep it because about 90% of it, if you connected them up, it'll make up your innovation challenge um, final design. Now, if you look at um, the system we plan to build, it's, it's nice to think about it in terms of uh, pictures. You got your car um, and in the cart, you have a battery, you have a motor controller, um, which Les is going to talk about in detail. Les, you haven't still done the controller, but no, not yet, but uh, we're trying to get this and the CAD work out of the way mm -hmm. and do the, uh, the controller so people are overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the battery, the motor controller. So basically battery stores the energy that needs to drive your car. Um, the motor controller controls the um, energy that comes from the battery and put into the uh, motor of your car. And therefore it controls the speed uh, and the acceleration you're traveling at. Um, then you have other inputs, like um, I said, you can have an optical encoder or an optical tachometer that's on the wheel that, that measures the number of wheel revolutions. You would have buttons for your um, indicators. You might have a brake uh, indicator, all these other things you would have in the car as well. Now, and, and of course the voltage sensors, the current sensors and stuff. All that uh, would communicate with your Arduino and tell information about the car. So you would extract information like the battery voltage, the battery current, the number of revolutions the wheels are rotating at, um, temperature of the battery, all this information would come into the Arduino as analog signals. And then the Arduino itself has the hardware needed to convert this analog signal into digital signals so that the computer can do its own magic and figure out the power going into the motors, the energy left in the battery, and so on. Um, and then it goes into the, um, oops, what's drawing on my screen? Um, okay. Um, so, and then it goes, uh, the Arduino decide all these numbers, put it into um, your screen, and display all these numbers for, you, for your driver. And as an ad additional thing, you could also try to transmit that through Bluetooth onto your mobile phone and also onto the web so people can also view it from uh, not only inside within the car, but from outside. Maybe you might be in the pit uh, waiting for your friend to drive the car along the track, um, but you can also view how he is doing um, and, and give, you, give him advice, uh, him or her, uh, how to drive better. As, uh, as you train. Now, as engineers, we like to, uh, this, is, this is great, but as engineers, um, which I'm an engineer, and so I, as an engineer, I like to think about as a, a, a system diagram or a block diagram, so we can um, put some um, 
more information into this, figure out what parts we need, uh, what signals are we getting, what signals are we producing as the output and so on. Uh, so the central part is the computer and the computer that we are going to use um, is an Arduino Nano. Um, in the Proteus, um, so Proteus is the environment we are going to simulate all this system before we go and build it. Uh, it has a number of advantages. So you're seeing Proteus on my right hand side of the screen. Um, one of the advantages is if you make a mistake, you can, it's really easy to find in Proteus. But if you make a mistake in the hardware, if you build this and try to test it, then you might blow up something. You need to buy new components. It's going to be expensive. It, it'll take a lot of time. Therefore, simulation makes much more sense. First, try it out, make sure everything works, and then go and build the hardware. This is how engineers work these days. So um, we are going to use the Arduino Nano um, as the computer. And in Proteus, it can easily work out what uh, this Arduino Nano would do with your software. Uh, so you can easily troubleshoot and make sure your final code is polished up before you go and build the hardware. Now into the Arduino Nano, we're going to have some signals coming in. Very first thing is we're going to measure the voltage of the battery and the current coming from the battery and going into the motors using a voltage and a current sensor. And this information is going to come into the Arduino. Uh, then we would use a tachometer or, or a um, encoder that, that measures the number of revolutions the wheel is doing so that we can work out the speed and that information comes into the Arduino Usually the output of the tachometer is a pulse. So it comes into the Arduino as a pulse. Uh, then we have other information like temperature uh, sensors, uh, monitoring the battery temperature that'll come into the Arduino. Um, then you might have the brake pedal switch, which will come into the Arduino. All this inf information comes into the Arduino and the Arduino makes all the decisions and then decide what do I display in the screen? And then it tells the screen display, my battery capacity is XX percent and my uh, drive power is so many watts and so on. Uh, then it would also send this information through uh, a Bluetooth module to a phone if you like to do that. Um, then you might also decide that you might send some of this information to your motor controller, uh, which Les would teach you uh, later in the course. And uh, the motor controller might use this information to even fine tune your, uh, tune your driving, maybe may do the economy run a bit better. Um, also, you would have some form of power supply that you would need to um, supply because your computer needs some power. And when you're running it on a track, you can't plug it into a computer. So you need to have some form of a battery that powers it. Usually what uh, students do is um, you buy a, a portable battery pack that you buy these days to charge mobile phones with, and you connect it to the Arduino through the USB port, um, and it powers the Arduino and everything else. So it's quite easy. You just invest a, a few, um, usually a portable battery pack is about 10 to $20. And that would uh, power all the sensors and all the display and the Arduino um, using that uh, portable power supply. Can I just comment, um, Dalipa, that last year people um, found it convenient to separate the Arduino power supply from the 24 volt batteries yeah. on, the, um, on the cart because there are a lot of surges uh, as the motor speeds up and mm. slows down then, and that make the battery voltage to the motor change. Mm. It can affect the, uh, the Arduino microcontroller. Yeah. So yeah. to have the two separated makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like uh, if you, for example, if you go to PB Tech and search for a portable power bank, um, you can buy any of these. Um, you don't want this expensive one, something cheap, um, and um, that would work for you. Um, so you connect up the USB from here onto the Arduino and it'll power it. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Right, so, so this is what we had to build. Now let's look at in small steps, how are we going to build this? Right, um, so the first thing you had to do is you need to build the sensors. Um, you might buy these sensors from eBay or from Les or somewhere else, or you might decide to build your own sensors, um, but you still need to know how they work. So you can, when things go wrong, you can come and uh, troubleshoot this. And you also need to be able to put things together, connect these sensors up together, 
uh, to the Arduino itself. Now there are a number of ways to connect things, uh, these modules up to the Arduino. Um, the best way is to use something called a printed circuit board or a PCB. Anyone seen a PCB before? Mm, no. Yes. So the, piece, uh, the printed circuit board or PCB is where we assemble all the electronic components like resistors, uh, the Arduino module, all the sensors, everything. Um, usually it's a green colored thing. It doesn't have to be green colored. It's something like that. So you can see here, you have uh, a number of resistors and stuff here. And these lines that go between them, they're connecting them. They're basically copper lines. You know from uh, physics that copper is a really good conductor, right? So it connects up each device and you put, um, you solder it using a soldering iron um, and some lead. Lead is also a decent conductor, connect making connections between devices. Now, this is good because once you solder things, they don't come apart easily, right? Um, they stick together um, in a card things would be vibrating quite a bit. So if you don't have a good connection, things would come loose. You would have issues that you had troubleshoot the wiring and everything, it's, it's going to be painful. Um, so for your final design, it's, it's nice to assemble everything and solve everything together. But until you come to the final design, one thing you can do is you can use something called a breadboard. A breadboard is, um, is cheap, uh, a few, um, few dollars less i don't know how much uh, a breadboard is usually three dollars i think there yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and the nice thing with the breadboard is it has these holes where you can plug components in and uh, the holes in this uh, breadboard from here to here in each row they're connected together so if you want to connect up uh, sorry each um crosswise row across um that's a column right that's a row is it I always get my cross and columns crossed. Yeah, but crosswise, it's they're connected. The five holes yeah. that you've got the cursor on are mm -hmm. connected, and then there's the centre of the board, and yeah. there's no connection across to the five on the other side. Yeah. So if you yeah. want two wires to connect, you put them in a row of five dot, uh, holes, and if you put the two wires in any of those five holes, they are connected under the board. Yeah. So you could see here uh, on the right hand side the green line shows the holes that are connected together using a wire underneath the board. Uh, so if you put a um, component from here uh, to here, uh, and then another component from here to here, then these two components would be connected together, for example. Um, now this is a quick and easy way to do it, uh, connect components together so you can buy your modules, put them on a breadboard, connect them up together, and test things and make sure everything works. But by the time we come to the competition and driving the car around, it's not a great thing because once your components start vibrating, they might come loose and they might not make good connection. Um, it, so it, it's, it's better um, to solve the things together once you have finalized everything. Uh, but until then, this is a great way. Now there's another cheap way um, called a uh, Vero board. So you don't have to build your PCB. PCBs take time to build. You need to have skills to build it. Um, uh, so a cheap and easy way is to use a Vero board uh, and solder your components on a Vero board. Um, can, can I can I just say, uh, Dalipa, what mm -hmm. we do have is with the um, the boards down below. The uh, what did you call them? Proto boards or um, uh, breadboard? Board okay, um, we've got one that is a, that's a I, I forget how many ties they've got in that one there, but it's one very similar to that in layer. Uh -huh. It is. A, um, a PCB. So okay. if you build it on that board, you mm -hmm. can just transfer the components over to the same holes in the PCB to make it permanently. Oh, and cool. That's nice. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it actually matches the breadboard. Yeah. Yeah. So how many of your schools have uh, soldering facilities at the school? I think all would somewhere. Okay. <laughs> it's a matter of finding out where it is. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, Right, so that's, that's about building your circuit. Um, now let's have a look at a simple circuit. How many of you are familiar with um, electronic circuits? Do you, do you learn electronics at school? Is it a subject? It's still a subject, right? 
in some schools it is, and in, uh, in technology there's uh, some electronic support. Okay. In technology and a little bit in science as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so uh, an electronic circuit um, basically has um, usually a power source. Um, you, you take, you need some sort of a uh, power source and uh, for some of the electronic circuits, you take the power from a battery pack. Uh, sometimes more, more demanding electronic circuits, you take power from the uh, 230 volts AC uh, using a power plug, um, or you can power your electronic circuitry using things like solar panels and so on. So. Um, one thing that always common with electronic circuits is it needs an electro, uh, electrical power source. And in this uh, simple circuit we are going to study, we are going to use a battery pack um, made out of uh, some uh, AAA batteries um, as the power source. Um, now, uh, the battery pack itself has a voltage across the battery. And uh, when you put that together in a circuit, in a closed circuit, it creates a current to flow in that circuit. And that current basically goes through the circuit and uh, does the work for us. And that's how the electronic circuit does uh, whatever we want it to do. Basically current flowing in the circuit um, is, is something that you can think of as, um, as tiny charges that's going in the circuit and doing the work for us, um, what we require from that circuit. Um, you can change that flow of charge or the current in the circuit by putting elements like resistors. Um, that would resist the flow of the charge. Um, to get outputs from this current, you can use things like LEDs, uh, where when the charge is flowing through the LED, it generates light as an output. Um, you can dis uh, disconnect the flow of current by dis uh, putting things like switches. So this is a simple circuit that we can use. Um, similar to your um, light bulbs at home, you have a light bulb, um, you have uh, power coming from the grid, uh, from the power meter, and then you have a switch. Um, and if you op uh, turn on the switch, the light bulb turns on, completing the circuit charge flowing through the light bulb, and you disconnect the switch, um, current stops flowing through the light bulb, and the light bulb turns off. Um, now, does it, does it explain how a simple circuit like this works? I think, yeah, the simple circuits just need a, a battery or power mm -hmm. source. Mm. And a full loop in the circuit for the things to work. Yeah. Uh, and the other third requirement is something in the circuit to use energy. Yeah. Otherwise, you've got a connection between one side of the battery and the other. Mm. It's a short circuit and the wire heats up. Yeah. The, the switch just acts to break the circuit and make it incomplete. Yeah. It completes it. And in here, the resistor slows the current down, but it also. Uh, in doing so, take some energy away from uh, the current that's flowing to make uh, the energy available for the LED uh, at an appropriate level that won't damage the LED. Yes, yes. And uh, as you consume the um, power or the energy from the battery, the battery would start discharging and the voltage across the battery would come down as it, as it discharges. And eventually the battery would run dry and then you'd have to replace the battery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, if you wanted to um, build this circuit, what you do is you, you take a battery pack, you take a push button, you take a breadboard um, and uh, a resistor and an LED. And like we said, in, in a breadboard, these lines, uh, these um, are connected together. So you can put a resistor from here to here and a push button from here to here, like here, and then put a small wire from here to here to connect these up together. Um, these jumper wires are also easy to buy. They're very cheap. Um, um, we call them jumper wires. Um, and then you jump a wire from here to here into the LED and back into the battery. So you build this circuit on a breadboard quite easily. And if you have had built this properly, if you press this push button, it'll light up the LED. And if you let go of the push button, it disconnects the LED from the battery and no current goes and uh, the LED turns off. Um, we did an example last week as well. But, but to show you, again, uh, this a bit more in detail, I have built a circuit again in the Arduino file that I shared with you. But this time I also put a voltage meter so I can measure the voltage that I'm applying across the LED and the resistor and also a current meter or an ammeter so I can measure the current going through the LED lighting it up. So if I run the simulation by clicking on the play button, 
Now, initially, um, the LED is dark. It's not turned on because I have not pressed the push button. Um, the battery voltage I'm using is five volts um, so that it, it's the same voltage as the Arduino, okay? Now, if I press the push button, it connects five volts. You can see the voltmeter goes onto five volts and then creates a current of flow because the circuit is now complete. The current flows around from the positive terminal of the five volt sub battery down back into the negative terminal through the LED lighting it up green. Um, there's 27 milliamps of current going through the LED. Now, if you wanted to reduce that current, what you could do is you could increase the resistance to that flow of current uh, by um, maybe let's say 200 ohms and that basically reduce the current. Now, if you press the uh, push button, you have half the current going and as a result, the LED is dimmer. Um, so that's that's nice because before even we go and build this in in um, in a breadboard, we can already confirm that it is working um, in Proteus. Now, going forward, um, how do we build our uh, voltage sensor and the current sensor? So the voltage sensor is um, quite easy. We use something called a voltage divider. The problem is the Arduino can't read 24 volts easily. It'll damage the Arduino if you directly put 24 volts onto the Arduino. So it wants to have a voltage that's below five volts so that it doesn't damage the Arduino. Now to get the battery voltage down from 24 volts to five volts, what we can use is something called a voltage divider. It's simply two resistors. And uh, the nice thing with the resist two resistors is it, when you put them across the battery, it creates a current of flow. Um, and if one resistor is, uh, if the top resistor is much bigger than the bottom resistor, um, when the current is flowing, there will be only small voltage across the bottom resistor. And by changing the ratio between these, according to this formula here, we can make sure that the voltage that we put into the Arduino from this end is always going to be around five volts or less than five volts, so we can safely measure it from the Arduino. We'll look at this in the next module in more detail, where we would actually build a voltage divider okay. or a voltage sensor in Proteus and test how it works um, in detail. So, well, can I just say there, um, Philippe, with that mm -hmm. voltage divider, one of the principles in circuitry is that whatever <coughs> voltage is put into the circuit, uh, which is kind of energy per charge going around, um, has to be used up before the charges come back for another dose of energy. Hmm. And uh, so going around that circuit for five volts is put in and both of those resistors in the voltage divider are the same size, then half the energy is going to be spent in one and half in the other before it comes back to um, the battery. And that means as you follow the voltage around, at the positive terminal it's got five volts. It's got five volts because no energy is lost around to the first resistor. And then after that, it will drop from, if the two resistors are the same, it will drop down to half that voltage. So the midpoint between the resistors would be 2.5 volts. And then yep. the last resistor, the bottom one, would take out the last 2.5 to, to reduce it to zero at the bottom. So having two resistors the same size would make the um, midpoint voltage half the input voltage, if you like, of 2.5. And as Dilipa said, you can juggle the size of those resistors to get whatever voltage you want at that midpoint just by having one bigger than the other and yeah. not the same size. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so we, we would test this out next week um, uh, in the next module. Um, now, this voltmeter, um, like you can measure the voltage across here. In Proteus, it's these green devices that acts like the voltmeter. So it doesn't look exactly like the yellow one that you would physically use in the lab. Uh, but this green one in Proteus is a voltmeter that would uh, replace this uh, actual physical uh, voltmeter you would use in the lab. This is an ammeter that measures current in the circuit that you would probably use in the lab. Uh, again, uh, we usually have everything integrated these days into a, something called a multimeter that looks like this. Okay. Right. So now we're going to learn programming. That's, that's all the electronics we're going to use um, and learn. Uh, the next, next um, sort of uh, the 
biggest topic that we're going to learn in these modules is, is how to program. Um, now, what is the computer? So everyone got many computers around you these days. You have computers inside your mobile phone, in front of you on your laptop, uh, on your tablet, in your watch. Everything has a computer these days. Um, so what is in a computer? It, it has a processor. Um, so it basically has um, some form of a brain uh, that does all the processing. So it gets all the information, processes it, and then it decides what to display to the user. Um, so it has a display. If it's a phone, it's your phone screen. If it's a computer, it's your um, monitor. Uh, if it's your watch, smartwatch, it's your uh, watch display and so on. Uh, also for the processor to work properly, it has to have some memory. And um, in, in a laptop, you, you would measure the memory in terms of the RAM you have and the hard drive space you have in terms of gigabytes, how many gigabytes you have. Um, and um, in, in case of a small computer like the Arduino Nano, uh, they're not in gigabytes, they're in, in, in simply kilobytes. Um, also the processor uh, in the computer, you would have input devices like your mouse, the keyboard and, and so on. And you have connectivity like Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth and these sort of things connecting up your processor with external um, devices. So that's, that's everything is a computer altogether. Now, of course, we can't really want to, we don't really want to put a laptop inside your car to do all that. So we want to use something really small, um, really light, so it doesn't load up the car, um, or your cart, um, and something um, really cheap. Um, so in case you drop it, damage it, you don't really lose thousands of dollars. Um, so for this, um, we can use something called a microcomputer or a microcontroller. Now a microcomputer is, uh, an Arduino is a microcomputer because it's, it's a very tiny computer that's pretty much, uh, that fits into your wallet basically. Um, now talking about computers, it's quite interesting to see how computers evolved. Um, in the early days, the computers used to be mechanical. They didn't have, to, they didn't have any electronics in them. Everything used to be um, mechanical uh, teeth that rotates. It took entire rooms. Um, and, and so on. Uh, and then they sort of turned into more electronic uh, de devices that use electronic components. Uh, then we sort of progressed into supercomputers, the desktop computers, um, and then um, the future, people are looking at things like quantum computers where now we, are don't, we don't even use electronics, we use light to do all the processing. Um, again, we have these small computers that are like your mobile phone or the microcomputers like the Arduinos. Now, for this project, the microcomputer is the best thing we can use because it's tiny, very cheap, um, and also it doesn't need a lot of power. Like if you had a laptop, it needs a lot of power to run. Um, so for all these reasons, we are going to use something small. Um, so we call it the microcomputer or a microcontroller or an embedded computer. Um, and, and the Arduino Nano is the one that we're going to use in this project. Um, so using an Arduino, um, uh, now I should tell you that Arduino Nano is not the only microcomputer that's out there in the world. There are thousands and millions of these devices. The reason we use an Arduino Nano is there's a lot of work go, um, that students like you uh, have done around Arduino Nano. So there's a lot of internet forums that talk about how to do things. Now, very first um, starting point um, with Arduinos um, is to go to the Arduino website and go to um, resources. And in resources, there's a lot of different uh, tutorials, designs that you can use and so on. Also this um, page called um, Tut references is quite useful, which you're going to use um, in this um, course quite readily um, to work out what we had to do with the Arduino. Now, they're, they're programming statements, aren't they? Yes, yes. Um, so we'll learn about what a program is first, and then we will start learning about um, what sort of statements can we use in our program so that the Arduino knows what we are asking it to do. Um, so, how do you make your microcontroller or the Arduino think? Now, 
this you do it by doing um, developing something called a software program. Um, and a software program basically tells your Arduino or any microcomputer to do a certain list of tasks. Um, in this case, um, we use uh, things like conditional statements and variables. A variable is like uh, when you do maths, you have A equals five plus seven, A is a variable. Um, and a conditional statement is where you say, if this is greater than this, or if this is less than that, and so on. We use this um, sort of variables and conditional uh, statements to implement different algorithms or different software statements that we will write. And then we are going to use things like for and while loops um, to make sure that we run this program as many times as needed so that it, it keeps running. For example, in our case, we want to be displaying the information forever. So we want, to, we want the computer to run forever. The computers usually do a task and then it just goes to sleep, turns off. So you don't want the computer to do that. So for, to keep the computer awake and keep asking it to do things, we need to use things called um, loops. So we're going to learn how to use uh, loops and uh, variables in this uh, first module. Um, we talked about the Arduino Nano. Uh, the other thing that we need to talk about is the Arduino IDE. Uh, integrated Development Environment is, um, uh, IDE stands for Int Integrated Development Environment. And that's this um, interface that you use to write the program for the Arduino. So everyone can download this uh, from um, Arduino website for free, and uh, you can write uh, use this to write your program. So let's let's start writing our first program now. Um, we would come to this later. This is talking about how we can set it up if we had an Arduino Nano. Um, if Les has an Arduino Nano with him, maybe we can uh, share uh, the uh, sort of put it on the screen and then uh, show how you can do this a bit later. Um, so let's uh, write our first program to blink an LED that we connect to the Arduino Nano. Um, so let me do something. Right, um, so inside the Proteus, I have set it up. So the Arduino Nano is controlling an LED and this LED is connected to pin six of this Arduino. So over here, you can see this is labeled as IOC six. And um, also at the same time over here, this point is labeled as IO six. Now I could have alternatively without putting these labels, I could have drawn a wire from this point all the way to here, but it looks really ugly. So that's why I have not drawn this wire, instead use um, these names to connect them up, which is quite common in electric uh, circuit uh, drawing. The, right. the IO means input output. So the pin six, yeah. IO six, means it could be an input or an output, depending on what you tell it to do. Yes. Um, so we're gonna write our first program. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna go file, new and then it'll open up a new uh, interface for us to write our program uh, in arduino a program is called a sketch so it'll say sketch something so on so on uh, but we want to name it something more sensible so we're going to go file save um, and i'm going to save it onto my desktop and i'm going to say my first program okay and hit save now, once you save it, it'll change the name of your Arduino IDE to my first program, uh, showing that you have saved it um, in the Arduino. Now, in the, in the file that Arduino IDE created for you, it has two parts. One is called the setup area, and the other one is called the loop area or the loop function. Um, so, Something like this in programming is called a function where it is separated by these parentheses. Um, and in a function, you basically write your software that you need to, uh, you need the computer to do. 
the setup function or the setup area is to do all the setup. So for example, um, you might want to uh, say, I want to use this variable, please set up a variable for me. That would be done here. The loop area, on the other hand, is something that uh, the microcomputer or the uh, computer runs forever. So it, it starts, let's say you have statement one, um, um, I'll call it S1, S2, um, you have a S3 and so on. Uh, it basically goes through uh, your program statement one, statement two, statement three, statement four, and so on. Keep doing this. And then once it comes to the last statement, it comes back up again to statement one. And then it keeps doing that, comes back up, and it keeps doing this forever. If you don't do it, then what happens is, once it, uh, if you don't have a loop, it comes to the last statement, and the computer thinks, oh, I don't have to do any work, so I can turn off myself, and it just turns off itself. So that's why it's, it's quite important in the computer for you to have a loop, so it always keeps doing something. Um, if it doesn't have anything to do, it just stops and turns off. Right, um, now, very first thing we are going to learn is how to put uh, just a text area that doesn't mean anything, that doesn't contribute to your program. Um, why is this important? Sometimes you want to um, say that you wrote this software and we call these sort of statements comments in a program. So to put a comment, what you do is you put two backslashes and then you can say um, the leap uh, um, wrote this program. You can write your own, own name, um, wrote this program. So it, it basically uh, tells me on um, what is the date today, 11th of June. So it basically tells me a bit of information about what I'm doing here. And it's quite important as a program uh, programmer, a software programmer, it tells you um, that things that you can understand because a program is really hard to read and understand. Whereas you can write text that the computer would ignore by putting these two lines. Um, it basically tells the computer that ignore this line. This is something that I have written for my own information. Does it, does it tell, um, explain the purpose of this uh, comments or the text lines? Do you have any questions? I'll just say it, it's really good to put that in because it, uh, it gives you uh, it's, when you go back to read it, it tells you instantly about what you're trying to do. And uh, for someone that has to check the program, it's really good to have that in there as well so that you can understand what the person's trying to do. Yeah. yeah, and the important thing to remember is anything that you write after these two backslashes is ignored by the computer. Um, so Arduino does not read that. It's it's only for you to read. Um, so Arduino, look at this and say two backslashes. It's nothing to do with me. It's to do with whoever wrote this and it ignores it. Um, there's a couple of messages. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so the next thing we are going to do is um, now we are going to use the Arduino to light up this LED um, first. And to do that, we know that to light up the LED, we want to create five walls across the LED, okay? Now, all the pins on the Arduino is capable of creating five walls or zero walls. Remember, we talked about logic one and logic zero, or logic high and logic low, or a logic true and a logic false. Um, so a logic one or a logic high on an Arduino, when you generate it as an output, it's translated as five walls a logic zero or a logic law is translated as zero volts. So if you put five volts across the LED, it'll turn on definitely, right? So we want to tell the Arduino to create five volts at pin number six. Um, now to create five volts, the very first thing the Arduino needs to know is um, to figure out that I need to use this as a list mentioned about I and out, uh, I and O, the reason for that, input and output. Now, if it's an input, Arduino can't generate a five volt output. It needs to be an output. So we had to tell the Arduino that we need five volts output, not an input um, at that uh, pin. So we would do that by using a statement called pin mode. And we want 
pin six to be what we are considered, uh, what we are concerned about. And we want it to be an output. Okay, so basically that program statement, very first program statement we wrote, tells our Arduino, pin six, I want it to be used as an output. So we can generate five volts from it. Okay, now I'm going to add a comment here that Arduino would ignore, um, saying uh, setting pin six to an output. Okay, so it basically um, tells me what I have done. Uh, this line tells me what I have done. This line tells the Arduino what it should do, right? Okay, now once we have done this, in the loop what we can do is we can start creating five walls now. So to create five walls, what we had to do is we had to output a logic one to pin six. Now, for this, Arduino provides another statement called digital write. Um, and of course, the digital write, it can write to any, any of the pins, so it needs to know which pin it is. So we're gonna say we want to write it to pin six, and we want to write a logic high or a logic zero to create five volts. Logic high. Logic high. So we want to write a high into this pin. Therefore, it becomes five volts. Now we have finished our first program. So we are going to um, put a comment here just to inform us what we have done. Um, setting pin six to high, which means it's the same as six volts. Uh, sorry, five volts. Okay. Right, so once we have written the software, what we're going to do is you're going to come here and hit verify like we did last time. So let's hit verify. Hopefully I don't have mistakes in my code. It's done all the stuff. It says everything's good. Now it has prepared my file in that folder that we created last time called Arduino outputs. And it says my first program dot ELF. Now we want to go here to my Arduino and show that ELF file, so Proteus knows which file to use. So go open, um, I'll do it again, just slowly. Double click on the Arduino Nano in Proteus, click on the folder, go to uh, your C drive, Arduino outputs, then find that ELF file, press open and press okay. It's not, that's all done. Now if you press simulate, it should turn on this green LED. Yeah? Yeah. Right, now we want to blink this. How do we blink it? Now blinking the LED means we have to turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, right? So we know yeah. how to turn it on. Do we know how to turn it off? Yeah. So we write a digital to the same pin, a low. A low is basically zero volts, right? So I'm gonna put my comment here so I understand what I have written. Uh, setting pin six to low, in this case, it'll be zero volts. Now if I make it zero volts, it'll go dark. If I do this one after the other, how much time would it take for this, uh, my computer to do this and this? Um, what would be the time difference between these two? How fast can a computer think? Really fast. Really fast. So it will basically do this and do this very next instant. So you would not see it. So what you had to do is you had to tell the computer, wait for a bit before you do this, right? Yeah. So the, the way the computer, you can tell the computer to wait is using something called a delay function or a delay statement. So you say delay, um, and I'm going to delay uh, in this Arduino delay statement, it takes milliseconds. So if you want to delay one second, how many milliseconds is there in a one second? 1,000. 1,000, yes. So you delay for 1,000 milliseconds or one second, 
and then turn off the LED. Then what happens is because you are in the loop, once you do that, it comes here. Is there any, what's the time difference between turning it off and turning it on now? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing. again. So you had to put a delay again because you want to make sure it's turned off for a certain time. So you put delay again, I'm going to say one second. Um, so it's going to stay turned off for one second as well. Right. So if we now build this program and run it in Proteus, it should be blinking the LED. Can you see it blinking? Yeah. Yep. Right, so you had done your first program that blinks an LED. Okay, so the next thing we are going to do is um, we're going to do something a bit more fancier than uh, what um, than this. Um, and this is basically getting the Arduino to talk to you in English. Okay, so we've done some blinking and stuff. It's not so exciting, but if you can actually, can you get the Arduino? to print your name on the computer. We can do it in a number of different ways, but the easiest is what we called um, using a terminal and serial communication. Now, there are different ways of communicating. Um, you know that on the Arduino, you have a USB. Um, if you had a computer, you have HDMI. Um, if you have a car, you have something called CAN. There are many, many different types of ways to communicate uh, between the computer and you. Um, and you have Bluetooth and all the other things as well, Wi-Fi and so on. Um, we are going to use something simple called serial. So serial basically sends a number of ones and zeros to what it wants to communicate. In this case, we're communicating with our screen and it sends ones and zeros to the screen. So it draws on your monitor um, your name or displays your name on the monitor. Um, and in Arduino, we can easily do it using something called the serial, serial um, function. Um, so let's look at how we can do this. Now, if you want to read more information about all this, what you had to do is you had to go to the Arduino website, um, click on resources and references. Now, over here, we can see that digital write statement we used. It's already here. So if you click on that, it'll tell you how to use it. It'll give you an example and all these different things. And even the example that we did, it talks about it. Um, if you want to work out uh, another statement we used is um, pin mode, it's here. So if you click on that, it'll tell you how to set it up, what to do, an example and so on. Now the next one we are gonna to do today is called serial communication. So it talks about how to do everything. It's a bit more complicated than digital write and um, read. Um, but, and then within serial communication, there are many, many more statements you can use. What we are going to use is uh, two things. One is begin. It basically tells start communicating using serial um, language. Um, and then what we're going to use next is something called print. Print basically prints your name onto the screen. Okay, so let's see how we can use this. <coughs> um, so first thing is I had to start um, the serial communication or I had to tell the Arduino that we need to start using the serial communication language. So to do that, what we had to say is we want serial and we want you to begin um, this um, feature. Um, and it needs uh, some more information about this, um, which is the speed. So when you're communicating, uh, or we, uh, take an example, you're connecting to the internet. Usually when you're going to find your internet uh, provider, you go and ask them, what is the speed I'm going to get from your connection, right? Um, and in your internet, you might say 10 Mbps or 100 Mbps, or if you are down in uh, Christchurch or uh, somewhere, you can get one gigabit per second and so on. Uh, so, so that's your communication speed. Now, when you tell the Arduino to start serial communication, you had to tell how far should you communicate. Now you can put any different number here, but there are num set of standard numbers people use. And uh, one of the standard numbers people use is 9,600 bits per second. 
So it's very slow compared to what your internet is. Uh, if you think about the internet these days, it's at least 10 um, megabits per second. Uh, the computer communicates a lot slower. It's at 9,600 bits per second. Okay, you can make it a bit faster, but usually 9,600 bits per second is very standard for a lot of devices. <coughs> right, so now it basically sets up and tell the computer that we're going to use serial communication. The next thing we're going to do is in the loop, we want to start printing our name forever. Okay, so to do that, I, I'm using a statement from Arduino called print um, ln. Okay, um, now I want to print my name. Um, I'm going to say I am Tulip. Now you can't just do that because Arduino doesn't know whether this is a statement from Arduino or something, some text you want to print. So to say it is a text, what you had to do is you had to do curly um, statements around that. It turns into green um, and it identifies that it's, it's a line that you want to print. So the print statement is quite similar to what you would use with a print a printer, for example. It basically sends that information onto the monitor and shows it. So they have speech marks, are they? Are they uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so now you can go and file this. Uh, there's an error. Um, I probably didn't spell that properly. Uh, what is print line? Print. That seems to be correct. P R I N T. Mm. Oh, I had to do um, serial because I haven't told it to use serial or something else. So I have to say serial dot print. So basically, it's telling that we need to use serial. Um, communication mechanism to print this uh, line. Um, all right, so that's all good. Now, if I go here um, and run this, this small window would pop up and it'll start printing my name every one second. So that could be a screen. Yeah, this could be a screen that you're displaying uh, on your dashboard. Hmm. And that could read voltage equals or yeah. current equals. Yeah. So you could easily change this. So if I stop this and say, um, I could say um, voltage of the battery is, and then I build this and I run this here. So every second it shows the voltage of the battery. Now, if you want to print a um, number, you could do that as well. Um, that's that's part of the. Um, so I'll I'll show you how to do part of the. So what. I'm expecting you to do for the challenge that I talked about um, is to make up a stopwatch. Okay. Um, uh, so how it should work is if you press uh, a button, it should reset the stopwatch to zero and it would start counting from zero every second, one, two, three, four, and so on. And then as soon as you press the button, it goes back to zero again and starts counting up. Um, so in order to do that, we need to use something called a variable because we need to keep a track of the time. Um, now, there are different, many different variables uh, that you can use. Uh, some of the common ones are integers, which is uh, uh, basically one, two, three, four, five, six, up to um, a large number, um, or a character. Um, again, uh, ca the difference between a character and an integer um, a character only holds numbers all the way up to 255. An integer can hold a, a much larger number. A float is something like a decimal number. A string is uh, what we already said here, like a, um, a, a text, um, text line is a string and so on. There are many different variables. So we're going to, uh, for you to be able to build your stopwatch, we need to have a 
variable that can store the time. So if you're counting seconds, what type of a variable do you think is suitable? Integer? Yep, an integer would be a nice variable to use. So what we are going to use is we are going to use a, a variable, um, a integer variable, um, and to uh, uh, the statement to use is int. Um, it basically tells Arduino use an integer variable, and you can take uh, tell the variable name. You can give any name. Usually, it's good to give a name that um, makes sense. So I'm going to call in this case um, int uh, time. Okay, uh, time. Uh, I'll call it variable, and I want it to be zero at the start. Okay. Oh, also note um, every program statement has to end with that. Otherwise, um, Arduino would go crazy and figure out, oh, I don't know where the end of your program statement is. It basically tells you that's where the statement, um, how your program statement ends. Now, that, that basically sets up a variable, integer variable that I can use. Now, how would you increment this integer variable? Hmm. You can do a mathematical um, expression, right? You can add things in a computer, remember? You can add, multiply, divide, subtract, all this can be done in a computer. So like add one every now and like every interval? Yep, every interval it comes, every second, we can add uh, one into it. So I'm going to make this 500 milliseconds now, so it, it gets completed in one second. And if I take this variable now, time variable, um, and I'm going to add one to this. But I had to add one to something, right? What do I add it to? The same variable? So basically yeah. what I did was, whatever I had in the time variable, I took it and added one and put it back into the time variable. Yeah. So if you think about it, you started with zero, right? So this is zero plus one. This becomes? Um, one. One. And then it goes back, comes in. What is the time variable now when it comes back here? Two. This becomes yeah. one. Like as one, one time. Becomes two. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then it comes back again, three, four, five, six, and so on. So let's now display this time variable. Um, so I'm going to change my statement to time is. Um, and I'm going to add another statement. So print um, and my time variable. So basically, I'm printing that time variable together with this. Um, now, let's see whether it counts. Um, did I do something wrong? Um, okay, so Arduino has this. Um, you spelled um, you spelled time variable wrong. Yeah, you did. Variable. Yeah. yeah. I think it also has to be a global variable from memory. I got it right now, isn't it? The spelling's right. Um, it's because um, Arduino takes these to different. Uh, I'm used to a different programming interface. Uh, this one takes a bit. This needs to be outside here. Why, why is that? Uh... Um, because Arduino doesn't connect these two up together. It has some weird, um, from memory, some weird uh, way of doing it. So it needs to be, uh, for it to be common for all of them, it needs to be outside. If you write it inside, it's only going to be used inside that function. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you do that, it should be okay now. Um, this, we call it a global variable because it's it can be seen from the setup and also the loop, um, which has benefits and also disadvantages. Right, we have a counter. Um, now, it's, it's not printing so nicely, right? Because we want that uh, seven to be on the same line, isn't it? Mm. Um, mm. So we can change this. Uh, over here, if we go back to our Arduino references, it gives us some different 
number of print functions. So there's a print and a print ln. Now print ln stands for print and then add a new line. New line means like enter. Okay. So we are using print ln. Print function does not add an enter. So we want to basically make this a print so it doesn't add an enter after time is. So if you do this and then run this. Now it seems okay, but the three, uh, the number is too close to that uh, double dot, right? So we want some spacing. Um, so let's close this and add a space here. So there would be some nice space and redo it. Right, now it looks better. Mm. So, it, um, so it'll keep going um, until it uh, reaches the maximum this time integer variable can uh, uh, hold and then it come back down again. Um, now to complete this challenge, what you had to do is you had to figure out a way so that you had to put a button in. Now I can make it zero by putting reset, okay? If I reset it, it goes back to uh, one. Uh, but without this, can you do it? Can you put another button? So button is here. Um, so you can, oops, uh, I just stopped the simulation. Um, you put a button by clicking on the button um, and then you can wire it up to one of these pins uh, like this, let's say like that. Um, and you can wire this up to the ground, maybe ground here. Um, like that. And then now if you press the button, it makes the print zero. If you release it, um, it goes back to being five volts. So can you use this property uh, to um, reset this counter? Now this is something that you had to think about. I have given you some hints here, how to do it um, and uh, see whether you can do it. Okay. Sorry, it took yeah. uh, a lot longer than uh, one hour. So that's, hmm. that's the end of uh, today's uh, lesson. Yeah. Any any questions? Le Levi might have a question there. Mm -hmm. Yep, go for it. So when I'm trying to run the IDE, the stuff I've written for the IDE, uh, like in the IDE, it won't take .ino files? Um, where are you talking about? So I'm um, in Proteus. Yep. When I click simulate and I've set the Arduino file location to where the saved code is. Um, so you had to, um, so what you had to do is um, you had to, um, so the Arduino in Proteus, it takes an ELF file or a hex file. Yeah, so how do I make it an ELF or hex? Okay, so you haven't done the setup, uh, the connection between the two. So um, what you had to do is you had to go, um, go and um, select a place you would like to save your um, hex or the ELF file. I oh, would yeah. recommend just doing the C drive. So you go to yeah. C drive, create a new folder. Okay. Um, I called my folder Arduino outputs. Okay. Yeah, so when I did that on my laptop, it mm -hmm. stopped the IDE from opening for some reason. But I can do that now. Uh, if it stopped the IDE working, then um, I had a similar issue. What I did was um, go to your C drive again, users, um, find your username. Yeah. Um, and then go to app data. Um, local, mm -hmm. Arduino 15, um, take this folder called cache and these two uh, files uh, called, um, select all three by hitting control, by holding control and clicking on those two. Yeah. I don't seem to have an Arduino 15 in my local app data, but I will find it. Uh, it could be on the common as well, under default. 
Um, you don't have it? I do not seem to. Uh, and you have Arduino installed, right? Yeah, I've got the ID. Which one do you have? Do you have the uh, one that you get from the App Store or do you have the one? Yeah, I got it off the Microsoft Store. That'll be it. Ah, App Store one different, does it differently? I imagine it just saves it to a different path, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, that would be a bit trickier to troubleshoot. It might be easier. Um, this this only turn, uh, happened um, in an update Arduino did I think um, so. Levi, I think um, we we could sort Le Levi's out. Um, mm. Other people have to go. Mm. Um, they they should feel free to to leave. Yeah, and we'll do a catch up on Tuesday night if um, anybody wishes mm -hmm. wants to come in. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll deal with Levi's problem. But um, yep. thank you for hanging in there. It is a wee, a wee bit long. I hope I can uh, upload the uh, the video to the video, YouTube. Yeah. It might be a bit of a challenge, um, but uh, we'll, we'll get over that. Um, but thank you, and that's very valuable. Yeah. And uh, it's actually a really good exercise, to Levi. Cool. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. So Thanks. we'll catch you people Thanks. later. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, I know I know that uh, some people had many students around their computers. So okay, uh, that's nice. So that's good. Cool. Uh, so Levi, um, should we um, how to how to? Uh, I might have just found it. Uh huh. Program files. Maybe if you search for those file names, that might be. Yeah. There should be a link somewhere. Uh, maybe search for that file name package underscore index. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm in. It was in my documents, apparently. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So if you got the three files there now, Levi. Yeah. So the cache um, and these three, uh, just uh, move it onto the desktop or something. Um, uh, close Arduino first. Yeah. Um, and then uh, move it onto the desktop for now. Um, oh. Or you can just put it onto your bin as well. Um, you can recover it later if you wanted to. Hmm. Um, then if you open up Arduino, it should open. I want you to quickly change the Arduino outputs. I'm going to stop the recording, um, Dilipa. Yep, yep. All right.